Hi friends. Today I'm talking about medications and how they may impact or contribute to osteoporosis or low bone density. And it's important to me that we put this in context of all of the factors that contribute to bone density because I don't want the knee jerk reaction that people think when they hear about these medications, which is that they need to stop or quit them. That is not the message here. We should never change or alter important medication that we need for all of our health concerns without having a conversation with our medical providers. So let's keep this in context as medications being one factor of many factors that contribute to our bone health. Some that we have control over and some that we don't. I'm Dr. Lisa. I'm a physical therapist and a specialist in osteoporosis and bone health exercise and education. So let's kind of get down to what are these factors, some that we can control and some that we can't. Like how old we are is a factor in our bone health. If we are female, just going, being female and going through menopause is a risk factor of its own. You have a family history of osteoporosis. You can't change that. And that is a contributor. Your nutrition, especially your nutrition in your teens and early 20s when you were building your peak bone mass. If that wasn't optimal, you might not have established a high enough peak bone mass before it began to decline. Hormone imbalances, uh, thyroid or parathyroid hormone can affect our bone density and lifestyle, such as periods of heavy drinking, smoking or being sedentary, lack of activity for long periods of time. Having very low body weight is a contributor or risk factor for osteoporosis. Experiencing menopause early, whether it happened early naturally or via surgery. Chronic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, some autoimmune conditions or chronic inflammatory conditions can be a contributor to our bone health. And medications. So medications here as one of all of these possible contributors, and there are more. So we can't just say this one thing is the cause without putting it into context of all of these things. And some things we can't change and some we can. The important point is it's not our fault. We need to understand how valuable these medications may be. And then we need to understand what can we control and what can we do? And we will get to that. So let's look at the medications list that might be a contributor. And at the top of this is glucocorticoids or steroids that decrease inflammation. Prednisone is a common one. And often these are just really helpful and necessary for people who might have asthma or breathing issues, other chronic inflammatory issues. They're really vital and necessary and often create the ability to participate in exercise where without it, someone would not be able to. Anticonvulsants that prevent seizures. Wow, that's kind of important, don't you think? Uh, we have proton pump inhibitors for acid reflux or GERD, or heartburn. This is one of the few that might have the ability with some work with your providers to see if you could substitute something different, but we don't want to change this or stop taking this abruptly in any way because that can have negative consequences. Diuretics can lead to increased calcium excretion in the urine and that can affect our bone health. SSRIs, medication for depression can be a contributor, but so can unmanaged depression, which can lead to weight loss, and loss of sleep, as well as poor nutrition habits, lack of desire to participate in activity. So taking these medications to help manage our mental health can help us be able to participate in an exercise program, uh, get better sleep and have better quality when it comes to our nutrition. So not taking that is not a good option. Aromatase inhibitors are necessary for helping to prevent the recurrence of breast cancer. They are estrogen suppressing medications. And we won't want to ask somebody to stop taking that to improve their bone health if it increases their risk of breast cancer recurrence. And chemotherapy and the, the uh, uh, treatment for cancer, some of those agents can also contribute to that. Some, not all. So these are all possible contributors, but they're all really important and vital for the people that need them when we put into factor all of our health conditions. And how much a medication may impact your bone? Well, that depends on the dose. 
It depends on the duration and it depends on the health status and bone health status of that person when they take those medications. So all of that needs to be put in context of one factor that has one part of all of it that may be dependent on dose duration and your personal health history. So let's look at if we know that we don't really want to create any changes here without any conversation with our physician, what can we do? Well, the number one goal here is to not fracture. If you've already had a fracture, it's to not have another fracture. That's the impact of our bone health and osteoporosis is it's a risk factor for a fracture. And if we don't fracture, then it doesn't have to change our life. So we need to control what we can. That is some of the lifestyle factors. So nutrition is definitely something that we can optimize to take control of, making sure we're getting enough protein, calcium, getting some vitamin D, sunshine, and doing supplements based on guidance from the professionals that we're working with for our bone health. Strength training. So we help our bones and our muscles because bone loss and muscle loss go together. So we want to help do that to help keep us strong and robust and capable of doing the things we love and enjoying the activities so that we can continue to be active and enjoying our life. Almost anyone can do posture exercises because posture exercises can be protective for fracture. So simple exercises to help improve our posture, change where force is distributed in the spine can help reduce our risk for having a vertebral fracture. Balance exercise. Now almost everyone can participate in some type of balance exercise and that is helping with fall prevention. And since falls cause 80 to 90% of all fractures, then that's going to have a big value add for when it comes to protecting yourself and your bone health. Safe movement, just learning how to move smarter, not harder. Move in ways that have decreased risk and help optimize your ability to get the job done. And lastly, support. Gathering your support team, whether it's your medical doctor, your nurse practitioner, your physician assistant, your pharmacist, your physical therapist, your registered dietitian, your personal trainer, your support team is going to help you along the way with helping in all of these categories so that you are decreasing your risk for fracture. Just lastly, remember, please do not change any medication without a conversation with the prescribing doctor that gave it to you. And I want you to understand that that's one factor that is very important in the context of all of your health. Managing all of your health, not just your bone health, matters. And they all, if they're optimal, can help you be more successful in managing your bone health as well. If you found this helpful, if this gave you some peace of mind as you move forward, go ahead and leave me a comment down below. And if there's another topic related to bone health exercise or education that you'd like me to share and talk about, leave me a message. I would love to do it for you.